Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute. Delighted to be meeting uh, you on this, uh, what I called un jour gris, a gray day where I happen to be in Toronto today. And uh, we talked to our folks across the country just a minute ago. And we did the sound check and they're all saying it's kind of gray across the country today, interestingly. Um, we uh, we always acknowledge that um, this is a conversation of relevance, not only to people that live here now, but to the ancestors who preceded us, that this is, a, non, non, we all live in ceded or unceded lands from First Nations and we're Métis peoples. Um, and uh, we had a extraordinary event on the 30th of November in Ottawa with people online watching across the country and uh, where we had representation from Indigenous communities, but also people tuning in from uh, hundreds and hundreds of different places and how um, important that conversation is to be having about the quality of the place where you live and where you work and where you find fulfillment and meaning in your life. And um, I just want to acknowledge, as I suggested, the obligation we have to our ancestors, but also how we continue on the path of truth and reconciliation and what that looks like for us uh, as people that happen to live in Canada. I also just want to remind us all that, and we take a moment here to acknowledge that the world is at war. Uh, this is putting extraordinary pressure on people working, living and working in communities that they may have attachments to for their whole lives or their families' lives for generations, how painful this is and how precarious a time it is for us in the global community. Uh, and how do we how do we be empathic and uh, alive to the the truth and justice challenges that exist across? Uh, the world and how what how do we find ourselves in that? So uh, with that as a context, I want to welcome you to City Talk. Um, thanks for identifying yourselves in the chat. We have always have very lively chats on City Talk, and I want to just uh, acknowledge right off the bat that when we did the November 30th event, we branded as a City Talk, brought people on uh, uh, from across the country who couldn't be in Ottawa, um, but we weren't able to have as active an engagement with the chat because I kind of had my hands full with people in the room and da da da. So now's your chance online audience, if you've got questions, concerns, comments of what you saw uh, or what you listened to uh, on the 30th and you want to revisit it, or if you were in the room, if you were one of those lucky people who was in the nation's capital, looking at that extraordinary uh, view that we had behind the podium, which showed us uh, the edge of the parliament buildings and the Rideau Canal and as the sun came down, it was quite something. Uh, if you've got things that didn't get dealt with there and you want to pick them back up or you want to ask questions. We've got a very brave group of four here who were there, who were on the podium and had a chance to cover the, their favorite topics. Um, and uh, they're going to give you sort of an impression about what, what we, you know, we tend to call these things, what works, what not, what's working, what's not, what's next. And so we're going to do our version of that in terms of what did you hear on the 30th of November that you took away that were really interesting to you? and that you think we should be paying attention to. Uh, what did you not hear? What, what was missing from the conversation and or who was missing from the conversation? And, and what do you think you wanna add? And then the third thing, obviously we'll talk a group, uh, as a group about, well, what should our priorities be going forward uh, for 2024? And I'll just put a shameless plug in for this monster document, which uh, we released at the same time. It's in English and French. and with another set of, I think we had 44 people on the program on the 30th, and then we had another 40 plus that some some overlap, but lots of folks who just wrote something for here. And I always try to emphasize that CUIs in the provocation business, you know, there's no one, look at that, I have it, look at this, like, look, my mother, it's a good job, she's dead, she would not be happy to know that I came to work with a hole in my uh, elbow. Um, you know, it, it, we have to, we're, there's no single answer for any of this, and I think that's part of the conversation that we had on the 30th, and it's part of what we raise here, is that we need a robust discourse in this country about addressing challenges that are facing people in their lives, in their communities where they live and where they work, and how do we collectively arrive at good solutions. So welcome to City Talk. Fanny, I'm going to start with you, um, and I appreciate your working in your second language. So Thank you for speaking in English. We don't have simultaneous translation, lamentably. So you're gonna, uh, but you just told me that you spent years in Philadelphia. So give us your best shot in your Philadelphia English <laughs> about <laughs> what what were the takeaways that you, what have you been thinking about since? And what do you, mm -hmm. what, and what wasn't covered? Anyway, you started off and then I'll, we'll go across the country after we hear from you. Thanks for joining us. Merci pour l'invitation. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here and to share like my thoughts on, on this day. Thank you for putting it together. It was a great event. 
so many people, so many things were discussed. Um, I think the main challenge that were that was raised up from this day was the housing crisis. It came up in almost every session, uh, mm -hmm. but and there are two sub problems, sub questions like supply and demand, and right. uh, a lot of solution came up for uh, addressing housing supply, upzoning, expropriation for transit oriented development in in Vancouver. There is a lot of innovation all across Canada, uh, coming from like grassroots organization, coming from municipalities coming from the provincial government and coming also like th uh, this week from the federal government. So I think like the stars are aligned uh, for the like too late, probably because yeah. we're in a crisis. But like in terms of intergovernmental relations and coordination, like we're getting somewhere. And and then what's the, the question is, what about the demand? Uh, the demand is increasing and people don't have the means to access, uh, don't don't access like um, housing property or rental or and that's another set of questions and it links up to economic development like how we share growth and the wealth in our country and like that question wasn't addressed it was more of a supply issue than a demand issue mm -hmm. and so the, i think the housing park is really important another thing i would like to uh highlight is the fiscal imbalance between the levels of government like the the fact that municipalities need to increase their revenue sources their revenue streams new revenue streams in Quebec we have like a lot of innovation in terms of uh, municipal taxation so I can speak on that a little bit later so uh, those are my two like takeaways and in terms of economic development, what's the, the, the economic development strategy like at the federal level compared to the U.S.? It was brought up by Bruce Katz. Um, I think it's it, the future relies on the extraction of critical minerals, but no one is talking about it. Uh, certainly in Quebec, it, I think there, there's going to be a, a, an increased demand for uh, critical minerals for uh, the energy transition. But like how, with whom, how much? If we don't have this, okay, fine. We need to like secure this, and it's a there's like a homeland security issue or whatever. Like it's it's a global issue, but like if we agree that we need to extract some of it somehow, and it's is it really gonna in decrease greenhouse gas emissions? And I think it raises a lot more questions once we acknowledge that we need to to do it a little bit, you know. So those are my three takeaways. Housing, fiscal balance, and the economic development strategy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Fanny. You know, one of the things I thought about, I'm going to come to you, Donnie, next. Uh, one of the things that I thought about was, um, and this to me was mission accomplished, is that we were having a conversation about Canada, the future of the country, in the urban environment. In other words, it wasn't just a conversation about cities and this challenge and this city. And it was somehow, that's what we were hoping for, is to have a bigger conversation about the future of the country. And then how is that manifesting in, in uh, cities? And so the point you made about economic development, we're getting lots of people who who are saying, what the hell, you know, wh what is what's the vision? What's the vision and how do we fit in it? I, so I appreciate that. Um, and the housing piece, as you say, I, I always worry that when we finally align and we finally decide that this is something we all is it too late you know and and is it the and if we miss you know what I mean I anyway I wrestle with that but uh, but we'll come back to all three of the things you've mentioned Donnie you throw in uh, your additions about what the takeaways were for you sure thanks Mary it's great to be here I'm joining from the uh, unceded territories of the Musqueam Squamish Tsleil-Waututh -Tooth peoples um and I I while I work for uh, Squamish Nation I don't speak on behalf of any indigenous peoples and I don't uh, necessarily always speak on behalf of the nation uh, I speak on behalf of my experience 30 years in municipal government and uh, a lot in parks and recreation and then also working for First Nations government now um, I, what a great day it was first of all uh, Fanny I agree with all of your points fabulous points I think in terms of housing um, I think we need to be looking at indigenous models. We need to be looking at uh, uh, models like Sanok, uh, where it was a partnership um, and certainly developing and delivering um, quickly. Uh, they have the ability to deliver housing quickly um, with some investment in that area. Uh, it's been demonstrated. They also have the ability 
to deliver uh, with a climate lens. And I think that's another area that I think is really important that we need to be talking about. And I, and I did hear it, um, but indigenous knowledges uh, with respect to leading uh, climate action, not just with respect to listening to, but leading uh, climate action. What I heard that I was so excited about was a number of um, city managers, uh, the city manager for, from Toronto said this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Zita Cobb said this, the real activity is happening and happening at the grassroots at the local community level. And I think that I've, I know that I've heard that for years and years. And now to hear leaders saying that in the way they're saying it, what I'm hoping is that while the action is happening at the grassroots roots level, the decisions need to start to be connected to that versus happening in a silo over in the, as they call it, the ivory tower. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that it came uh, loud and clear, not only that municipalities are underfunded, but that maybe um, more solutions need to be sought in partnership with the private, uh, private public um, uh, discourse. And, you know, there's opportunity where you don't have to sell your soul to work uh, with private, if you're, you know, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, not necessarily needing to sell parkland to, you know, build houses, we can do both. It's not an and or. Um, and how do we bridge that relationship? Mm -hmm. You know, that um, the both and thinking, right, that we somehow need to move away from either or win, lose, zero sum. It's got to somehow be that our partners at ICLE, um, actually Jeb is the founder of ICLE, so I'll, uh, hats off to you, Jeb, your successors at ICLE Canada. Maybe you coined this term and I should be crediting you, Jeb, but uh, multi-solving, the idea that you never do one thing uh, that only delivers one benefit. You got to do things that deliver multiple benefits. And I think that's part of that challenge with the housing piece. Uh, if we just solve housing, and we don't build communities that have other amenities, then we're sunk. So I, anyway, we'll come back to that. But this idea of connecting, um, I've heard it referred to, you connect the grassroots. Is it with the grass tops? But this idea that we don't have that connected tissue very well about this works on the ground. Here's a national policy that you can see that in terms of how we're dealing with refugees, for instance, at the moment, you've got a big honk. We didn't talk about that last week in the way we might have. And uh, you've got this big national policy bringing lots of people in, but are we actually providing the necessary supports for them when they get here, right? Anyway. Mary, if I could just speak to that, it would be great if um, politicians listened to community more than once every four years. <laughs> That's a good soundbite. I'm sure someone's going to X that out, tweet, whatever. Uh, it, it'd be good if, we, if politicians listen to the community more than every four years. Okay, Patty, you're next, and then we'll go to Jeb. Go for it. Hi, uh, thanks very much. I oki nistawanako mistamot samyaki mameng aflongo, and my name is Patty Pond. I'm coming to you today from Mochkinstis, which is in the Treaty 7 territory, the home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, and the Sutena, Stony Nakoda, and the Otapemiswak Ota people, uh, the Metis Nation, and their new government uh, that they've elected very recently. Um, I think to Donnie's point, uh, I the conversation was awesome. And so I just, I do want to say uh, creating that gathering um, was a wonderful opportunity. I think I heard from lots of people. It was so great to be in the room. Um, this is the group of people that can help to make a difference. Uh, and and then sharing all of those common threads that you've heard from, from Fanny and, and Donnie so far. Um, for me, I think what I, I walked away with was an increased um, dedication. Uh, and I state my bias clearly, we have to include more creative thinking in how to solve some of these super, super wicked problems. Yeah. And when we talk about creativity, it's not something that if you didn't get born with that DNA, you are SOL. It's something that the more you do, the better you get at it, right? Um, you know, there's that whole joke about two guys in the street corner of New York, and one asks, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the other guy says, practice, practice, practice. And it's that's true. It's that's muscle. right. The muscle. And artists practice that muscle every day. Yeah. And, and you have to include creatives in this conversation. 
these issues that we're talking about are no longer something you can do on the edge of your desk. Right. These are systemic changes. It means risk. Mm -hmm. It means taking a chance on stuff. Mm -hmm. It means completely throwing away your assumptions and coming up with new answers. And there are people among you in your own communities who could help you look at the world in a different way. And when I think about the gathering and Mary and your team, I, I credit you for what I call small experiments with radical intent. That's you have a clarity. Crazy. Pardon me? That's a nice phrase. Say it again. Small. Small experiments with radical intent. Love it. And, and so there is a rigor to it, which is you got to come up with the hypothesis and the conditions and and all of our science friends can help us with that, you know, predict outcomes. And then you do the experiment and you see what happens and you scale up. So for me, I consider Calgary, which is my home, Walkinstis, a living lab. And the lab we do is how do we include creatives in these conversations? And by the way, for our economic development friends in Alberta, a million dollars into the energy sector will create two jobs. A million dollars into the art sector will create 20. Wow. So imagine if you had 20 creatives around your tables to talk about what the possibilities are around affordable housing. Yeah. And how they might think about different ways to create vibrancy. We all know shove artists into a neighborhood that's run down, really cheap. They'll move in. They'll create vibrancy. And then they get priced out of the market. Mm -hmm. We can't do that anymore. We have to think about how mixed communities start right from the beginning. And I think the final thing I'll just say here is um, one of my observations, and, and Jeb was our moderator, and I was very grateful to him for, for leading our conversation. Um, what I saw in Ottawa is not what I see in Canada, and certainly not who I see in my community, in my city. As Canada's third most diverse city, in Calgary, I know some of you may find that hard to believe, um, our panels, the 44 members, did mm -hmm. not look like Canada in mm -hmm. the way that I see Canada, that I want to see Canada. Yeah. And I think if we don't, if we don't intentionally, for those of us who have power and privilege, if we don't intentionally yeah. include the voices that have not been included before. I don't think there were enough people with lived experience when you talk about housing, when you yeah. talk about poverty, when you talk yeah. about healthcare concerns, there weren't yeah. enough people in the room for that. And we need to hear that. And then for those of us who maybe have don't have that lived experience, we got to figure out a way to hear it and not just not see that. Yeah. Um, Canada's greatest gift that I think we will give to the world is our ability to live together and have so many different identities, so many different ways that we walk in this world. And we have to figure out a way to share that gift with each other and then with the rest of the world. And I'll end on that. It, you know, these and these comments you're making, not just about that uh, convening, but as you say, that convening is an illustration of how we all work. And yeah. what are we, how are, and so from, I, I hear that very directly in terms of CUI and it's, its role as convener and connector is that we just have to get better at this. And the the idea, the, the notion of lived experience, um, another piece that I would say that we didn't do as well as we could is that if you're gonna, if you're all gonna go congregate in Ottawa, then you need to get out and see Ottawa. And, you know, should we Absolutely. be having some site tours? Should we be having some opportunities for people to get into Gatineau, to be able to talk to the community locally there? So some kind of concrete, experience and also a cultural event or two or 10. So all of that, just to say, how do you make it a more holistic experience? Just that piece. But, but I totally hear you about, um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a dilemma because we all just tend to default to who we know. And as you suggest, uh, we all need to know different people from who we know. And actually, uh, you folks are all in varying degrees in the public space business, the creative business. And that's part of how you meet people that you don't know is through those kinds of shared experience in the city. So totally appreciate that. The, the, the comment about creatives, we need creatives to problem solve. Oh my God, Patty. I see, someone's, <laughs> I see someone's put into the chat, yours and my podcast, where you go into this in more detail. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I'm with you on that in my various uh, roles that I've had before I took this job. Um, it was very hard to convince decision makers that artists are about more than creating art. That's right. Yeah. It's, and it's you we know, need, it's, yeah. Crazy. it's crazy. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say we, we need artists now more than ever. They are our storytellers. Yeah. They're our meaning makers. And, you know, in this time where nothing makes sense, we need those people who can who can filter and look at the world through mm -hmm. a different set of lenses and help us connect to things that you're like, how did we ever get here? Yeah. And not make you feel bad about it, right? Like that's the other thing that's beautiful. Even if you go to a provocative show inside a theater, it's yeah. still a safe space for you to have those feelings, to have that conflict mm -hmm. um, and then process it. Yeah. with the other however many people are in the room with you at that time experiencing it. So yeah. these are places where I think we can bring citizens together mm -hmm. and and not have the stakes so high that it's right. either or. Right. You're either for us or against us. Right. And we need that. We we need to be reminded that we actually have those muscles that yeah. we can we can um uh hone to right. get better at that. I mean, and just as you say, uh, uh, an artistic sensibility, it's a bit like an, it's, well, I shouldn't say they're not equivalent, but there's also the agrarian sensibility. Oh, it's absolutely. People that work in natural landscapes and who know how gardens work or know how agriculture works, they have a particular, they can see the whole. And I think that's one of the great challenges. Jeb, I'm sure you can talk about this because you've been mm -hmm. in the resilience business your whole career. And it's all about seeing the whole. So why don't I come to you next, Jeb, and then we'll uh, put put your mics on and we can start the collective part. Go ahead, Jeb. Thank you. Um, it's lovely to see you all again. Um, let me, I, I just want to pick up where uh, Patty left off. And uh, I, like the everyone else there, would just say it was an amazing event. Mary, kudos to you and your team. I don't know how the logistics of doing something like that are quite enormous. And I know you pulled it together quickly and that your whole mission as a professional and modus operandi in your career has been to sort of work this inclusive this thing and i think we did have a more inclusive event than has historically been the case but it did end up representing as this um still quite um isolated community that thinks about cities and things like that so um I, I pick up on your echoing it, Mary, but particularly you articulate it well, Patty, that it's going to take a different kind of modus operandi than inviting people to the event, because there's all kinds of reasons that people aren't their lives, um, particularly their urban poor uh, communities of a variety of kinds, new, new Canadians and uh, long settled black communities, uh, and uh, obviously indigenous communities as well. I think uh, when I work in the developing world on urban stuff, there are organizations that make sure slum dwellers show up, slum dwellers international, make sure Cape Town and there's always the slum dweller international delegation in a city of Cape Town conversation. Um, so I think we're going to need to, you know, if we now I'm I'm putting a we to it, but for next year's event, uh, really think about how constituencies are uh, engaged early and brought into the conversation. I final uh, comment on that is. Um, I also came away feeling like I didn't hear enough from Quebec. I mean, it's a very distinct society that does really interesting things. And I think in the Anglophone Canadian, we heard quite a lot about really cool stuff happening in British Columbia, for instance, but I don't think we got enough of Quebec in the conversation as well, um, if I may say. And, and thank you, Fanny, for uh, being there to bring some of it to the table. Um, my takeaway is throughout the whole day, I mean, uh, you know, one of the other issues I agree, housing thankfully just kept coming up and up and up again and from various angles in the conversation. But we kept, it as a, the traditional conversation around cities is we've got structural issues related to our constitutional arrangements. And no, we're not gonna talk about constitutional reform. Yeah, good, good. We didn't get into all that again, but it left me thinking throughout the day about constitutional workarounds. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that were said were basically like, here's how we work around it. And so today I just wanted to highlight a few things, two of them in particular, the thing did come up in the conversation, one that we might emphasize more in the future. Um, it particularly came up in the context of uh, um, Bruce Katz's, uh, that panel he was on, and Fanny, you were on the same panel with Bruce, were you not? No, the second, but it came up on your panel as well. 
about the lack of a national sort of industrial economic development strategy. And it brought to my mind very much so that there's no reason that there can't be a federal, local, regional government uh, conversation about uh, critical national strategies. And I noticed my, our friend and colleague, Dina Grazier, is on the line. It would be really interesting to hear from Dina, who oversaw the national housing strategy, to really ask how much was local regional government directly involved in that uh, strategy process? And what can we take away from that when we think about a national industrial strategy? Clearly on climate strategy, there's some conversation, but um, there's still always a, a, a divergence and an ineffective uh, strategy implementation in that regard. Um, I don't know, it didn't come up very much. Is there a local regional government federal conversation happening uh, effectively around strategy around immigration and settlement. Um, this is a decades old uh, issue uh, that comes up in our constitutional framework, as we all know, uh, immigration immigration driven by the feds and then the city's got to deal with it, that three or four cities got to deal with the bulk of, of what that means for the rest of the country. Um, is there strategy around uh, charter of uh, rights and freedoms implementation where there's any number of issues in our cities that are really fundamentally kind of charter issues that's come up in the last decade more around policing and police behavior, for instance. But is there a strategy around those things? So there's nothing constitutionally that doesn't, uh, it gets in the way of the feds engaging directly with local government and sort of bigger picture strategy and the housing strategy, Dina, if, if you're still with us, that would be interesting to hear from. The second one is around, um, and Fanny, you picked up on it on the on the fiscal relationship between uh, the provincial governments and, and local governments. Um, there's nothing constitutionally, and in fact, there's need, some neat stuff happening around the provinces really working to strengthen municipal fiscal authority and powers and access to private capital markets. Um, the, the impediments to municipal debt finance in the country are, if I may say, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, to the south, you know, we had some uh, folks from the United States. The municipal bond market in the United States is such an empowering tool. The lack of utilization of land value capture as a mechanism, particularly in a time of land speculation and financialization of housing, is just a, a fundamental failure in the conversation that can easily be had between the provincial governments and, and the local governments. So I thought that theme was on the table. And it, for me, because I work very much on how we're gonna finance climate adaptation, that's a conversation we need to have because we need new revenue sources to finance something that doesn't have a cash financial return to it. And there's billions of dollars needed there. Um, the thing that didn't come up enough, and this is my last point, is how local regional governments work together across the country to shape the markets they need for the type of housing production that's required or for the type of uh, other investments that we need in our cities for dealing with the infrastructure gap. Um, insufficient conversation about how we leverage collective market power to get industry be behaving and their interest addressing the needs of our cities that are so pronounced uh, and similar across the country. And there are examples of how cities have done that. Um, there's been collective procurement across the country uh, in the past uh, by groups and municipalities. Uh, the development of the green building as a whole industry, as a subsector of the, of the building industry, came out of municipal coll collaborative setting of standards for, uh, for building for public buildings. So I think there's more we could do there uh, in the future. But anyway, those, those are three kind of categories of uh, working around the constitutional problems and just getting on with the work if we if we can do yeah. so. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, you've raised some big stuff there. All right, let's put everybody on the, uh, let's have everybody on the screen and everybody open your mic and we'll just have some open chat. You know, I, the business about more Quebec, we got that from others, Fanny, too, that they wanted to hear more from Quebecers working in Quebec cities and in Quebec environments. And we had you and Maxime and um, it's, uh, you know, lots of parts of the country envy the attention that Quebec municipal municipalities in Quebec get from the province of Quebec. Um, you probably don't even, you guys just operate and don't think about it, but but the rest of us look quite, and if you look in Quebec City, Laval, um, maybe not so much Gatineau, but Montreal, you can see the commitment that the government of Quebec has made to their cities. So um, 
do you have further thoughts in terms of what Jeb's suggesting about how do we stitch together a stronger narrative between what's happening in cities in, in the province and, and yeah, across the country? Absolutely. I think um, the municipalities across Canada need to know what to ask for from their pro respective provinces. And for that, we need to share what's what are the possibilities in different uh, municipalities from different provinces? Because we can do things here in Quebec now, uh, but like land value capture, you can do it in uh, Alberta and Manitoba. But we, we cannot do it here. And the, the, our Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs is, is interested in that. So I think we need to share the... Uh, what what's possible, what to ask for from uh, the provinces, provinces, and then what can the federal government do? Like, okay, we want you want to, Maxim, you want to open the constitution. Why? What would you do with it? For what? Because, like, uh, what what can the federal government do? And uh, that's the question. And can he can he do it without um, modifying the constitution? And, so and that's yeah, and without stepping on the provincial jurisdiction. And so that's the two-edged sword for you in Quebec because the provincial government in Quebec has been quite uh, deliberate in in mm. influencing how federal money is spent in Quebec. Exactly. And we're hearing Alberta, Patty, it's coming your way too, where your premier is saying that they want to do the same thing. Um, I feel like during my tenure here at CUI, we've strengthened the relationship of people in, and remember, we're not just about municipal government here, we're about all of us, all the different sectors that throw themselves into urban life, but we've been good at strengthening the relationships between them and then between them and the feds, but we're we're not as engaged as I think we need to be about where do the provinces fit? And mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't surprised to hear the Minister of Housing uh, and Infrastructure, um, you know, that he got pushback from the Premier's conference two weeks ago about why the housing accelerator fund deals were being cut directly with municipalities and and yet we know that we want to have we want to have a direct problem solving relationship yeah yeah between absolutely. people on the ground and people who are holding a lot of the money right yeah i think um they they shouldn't take example uh, from the quebec government with m30 like the That's with the m30 the yeah, the I, I don't think it's good for anyone. I think we're losing as an uh, as a nation, Quebec. If you want to stay in Canada, then accept the money from the federal government. If you don't want to accept it, just separate, like pick one. You Listen, know? Fanny, from your lips to God's ears, I want to see whether or not you have more dinner dates tonight after having said that. But but, you know, this is part of the we have these kinds of granular struggles. We have it in the north, too. We have it in different parts of the country where you have to navigate your relationships. And I. I guess the solution for us has been let's focus on local challenges and figure out who's the best equipped to help address them. So I Jeb, to follow up with what you've just suggested and where Fanny was going there, like just solve it. Um, what is the role of large international conventions? Liz McIsaac was in the pro on the program talking about human rights approach to cities. Um, we know that there's a UN declaration on uh, on the rights of indigenous peoples. We're watching COP kind of, I was going to say implode. I don't know what how you would describe it. It's something's happening that's going to have an impact on us. What do you think, how important are those international movements to help us do the right thing in communities? Jeb. Well, I mean, and I worked on using those levers in, in my career, as you know, with, with ICLE on the sustainability front. Um, they're an important uh, mechanism to align um, interests set at different scales, but particularly local governments across the country and across uh, a continent around a particular policy agenda. Um, and we've seen in Quebec, for instance, uh, um, the way in which uh, the First Nations have uh, used the relationship uh, a human rights uh, charter issues with the United Nations to address uh, issues facing the uh, people in the North. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, th I think there are important mechanisms where there can be sanction uh, of local governments working in solidarity across the country or across the continent, and then use that to pressure their national governments to get on board. So one thing we did which see recently essence, at COP. Which is in essence huh? what's happening on housing. That's in essence what's happening on housing. Yeah. Everybody here is living, watching their local leaders yeah. 
throwing their hands up saying for crying out loud, we are in trouble on housing. And finally, yeah. the government, the provincial and federal governments are responding. But it's come That's from right. the ground to say, yeah. look at what we're dealing with. Okay. Yeah. So carry on. So uh in the in the climate context, what's in so now they have there, over the 30 years I've been involved with the COP process, the first COP was in 1995, almost 30 years, I guess that is, or yeah, we'll do the math. But um, there, at different stages, we as local governments have been very in, been able to get uh, language into the text that we can then go back and, and leverage with our national governments to do things. What tends to happen though is the countervailing forces, in this case, the industry, comes in and right. uh, delegitimates the involvement of local government. So you just got to take your own openings as you get them. Right. Um, but I, I think, again, I, let, not to overplay it, I think the bigger lever we have is to work collectively across the country and shape markets. I think our financial power so in the market is, so is more powerful. So right? let's get down on that a little bit, because the dilemma is, I think in the case of housing, uh, maybe pension funds, maybe investment funds, but uh, I don't know if Patty and uh, Donnie want to comment on this, but the my observation is that the development industry is highly regional in Canada. So the people building housing in Calgary are not the same people building housing in Vancouver, not the same people building housing in Montreal. So there may be engineering firms that are in both, but but the investor community perhaps is where some leverage. What do you think, Patty? What are you experiencing in Calgary? Oh, I would agree totally. On the housing front, it, I think it runs the gamut and it is largely regional. It's the it's the commercial real estate that is a national or a and beyond, like the Brookfields and okay. of the world. And so, um, the thing we see in Calgary, and I guess this is what I would offer, and I don't know if it's the same in other uh, communities. Um, as far as developers are concerned, they're super conservative and they will speculate like crazy. Like in Calgary, we have a 30% vacancy rate in the downtown, which yes. has had a huge impact on the ability of the city to collect property tax, right? On uh, If there's 30% missing. And we created a program uh, actually modeled after Why Not Theater in Toronto called the Meanwhile Lease Program. And it was to go to landlords who had empty space and say, look, we have a bunch of creatives and artists who would kill, not for free, but at something that's not market rate. And in addition to doing their own work, they'll create a vibrancy inside that space. And we could not get it off the ground for the longest time. And then one landlord came forward. And we it, it was an old shoe, shoe store in a rundown building in the middle of downtown. Alcove Art Center went in there and created a community art space, and now the landlord is booking spaces like crazy in their building. So it's so it's it's, it's an example of your small experiments with radical. That's engineering. right. That's one. And, that we're, and just while we're in the Dina Grazer shout out mode, uh, uh, Dina was worked on the Why Not Project and knows about that. Meanwhile, these programs. absolutely and um and we in turn shared that program with our uh, folks our. our our uh, colleagues at the federal level, and they're now looking at the possibility of expanding that program. So th these are these small experiments that I'm speaking to. The other thing I just want to bring forward, um, and I think Donnie will will be more uh, capable of answering it than me. A lot of these, like when you talk about policies, when you talk about declarations, when you talk about all these, these are all colonial constructs. Not one of them, kind of the UN declaration, kind of, but then it fit into a UN. UN. Model. Mm -hmm. well, how about we try something that is absolutely Indigenous centered, Indigenous led? How about we learn from, there are 725 nations on Turtle Island. Somehow they all manage to work together. Mm -hmm. Somehow they get past the politics. Mm -hmm. What is there to learn from the things that have existed on this land for thousands of years? And I think we got to get over, we are a country called Canada, 160 some odd or 70 years old, and think about a place that is tens of thousands of years old. Yeah. And what does that do to open our imagination and mm. rely on those who carry the knowledge to give us something else to try? What's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> like we're right where we are, which is, kind of a crap storm, if you ask me. So what's the harm in yeah. trying these small experiments with other people mm -hmm. leading the conversation and other constructs that come out of it? You Only know, 
uh, before Johnny, before you jump in, something that I often look mm -hmm. at is what are the impediments that we can take out? Like just, and then see what happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you're, and you're saying, what would happen if you just, instead of trying to predict what will happen, you just take away those colonial constructs and then see what happens. Go ahead, Johnny. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so um, I, I have a couple things I'd like to say. One is that uh, when I worked with uh, what was uh, soon to become formerly known as the Vancouver Park Board, um, I we were working on a colonial audit. And oh. that colonial audit was for us to take a look at all of our structures and practices and what was rooted in colonialism and what needed to change. And by doing an audit, uh, Indigenous-led audit of our systems and of the structure, we were able to tell the truth about why the park board existed, how it started, and how some of that, that how much of that construct was born in colonialism. I'll also offer this. Let's think about this. Time immemorial. What does that mean? Time mm -hmm. immemorial. How many of us can say? My ancestors have been here since time immemorial. I cannot say that. My ancestors have been all over. My ancestors have not been here since time immemorial. What does that mean? It means that homelessness or houselessness is only 150 or so years old. Right. Didn't exist before. Um, I will I'll also add that um, not, not only homelessness, but any of this uh, a construct that puts people in different um, or, or marginalized settings, like the indigenous cultures that I've witnessed, lift people up and share the wealth. Mm -hmm. It's not about uh, you know how I can push somebody down to get up. Um, colonialism has uh, been the root of climate change. We know this. So until we're brave enough to say, wait a second, we need to do a colonial audit on a grand scale, mm -hmm. we're not actually going to go to the root. We're gonna work with indigenous communities. We're gonna listen and we're gonna be nice, but are we really going to tackle the root of the issue? A, a comment just came into the chat, which from Sam, thanks Sam, which reflects my instinct, which is that it's colonialism and capitalism. They're yeah, kind of, yeah. They're kind well, of capitalism is a colonial concept. It's a concept, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an extra and it's all about extraction. And if you go back to Zita Cobb and what she was trying to suggest about that, we have this disconnect between local resources, local assets and global markets. Fanny, how does that sound to you? Because you're in a, a completely different cultural context. It is interesting to think, too, uh, how many entities we have, governance bodies, school boards, municipal governments, they're all older than Canada. You know, the mm -hmm. these. You know, the city of Ottawa is older than the city than the country of Canada is. Mm -hmm. The city of Quebec is old, 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 old. And then, as you suggest, Donny, all the indigenous communities. So, how do we? How do you square that, Fanny? In terms of your focus, your academic focus, you're thinking about this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the, this uh, this uh, conversation. I think like we need uh, to think about like a, a colonial audit. First time I've heard it. It's fantastic, and like in the meantime. It's necessary, but it's not going to happen like tomorrow morning. In the meantime, how can you, mm -hmm. what can you do? How can you do? Where can you do it? What form? Um, and it's the same thing with, uh, I'm thinking about um, flexibility. Like the, when I'm talking about like municipalities in Quebec can do stuff other municipalities cannot do. For example, Quebec municipalities have general taxation and regulatory charge powers. Uh, what can you do with it? Uh, Toronto has it, doesn't use it very much. Uh, there's a lot of creativity and around this, uh, the use of this new powers. And so we're working on that. And like uh, the Bill 39, which was just adopted, was just adopted, will allow um, tax rates a municipal tax rate to vary according to location, like sectors in the in the city, and also um, characteristic on the property assessment role. So if you have a bigger house, your taxation rate will be higher. So it opens the door for a more progressive taxation regime. Uh, it opens up uh, tax on vehicle registration rights, which mm -hmm. was 
also available under the general taxation powers. Um, taxation on vacant properties. Um, so it's it gives local governments the flexibility and the ability to have a framework that corresponds to their problems, is local issues, and all that. So I think, like, as it relates to other communities, how can you give uh, the le like the, the the leverage or the ability for communities to organize themselves and some some powers? Yes, you know? and when organization. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And Patty was thinking about creativity and doing you can do like small experiments with big intents and you can identify like um, like impediments to implementing your your solutions and then ask for changes to the municipalities or the provincial or the federal government based on those experiments so that's how i see it to enable it yeah mm -hmm. and you know as we sort of thanks everybody in the chat who are putting stuff in great to see so many of you contributing i appreciate the uh energy that people put into this hour um can we just talk now about economics the i was sort of surprised how much of the topic on the the discussion on the 30th was that because as i say i was worried that we just start zeroing in on one problem. Let's fix housing or let's fix transit. And here we had big conversations about where is this country going economically? And um, at CUI, we have a couple of programs around focusing on downtowns and focusing on main streets and the economies that are housed there. And I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how to stimulate a conversation as we come out of the whatever post-COVID Maybe inflation will adjust. I don't know. Maybe we're going to have peace. I don't know. What kind of economy do you think our communities should be contributing to and building? Who wants to take that one first? Patty. Me? Oh, if Jeff. I can, just, All right, yeah, Jeff. I, I can start from a, a point of view is I have no idea. I, it, it, <laughs> I understand. That's fine. It, that's my answer. And that's, that's because... maybe, maybe there's no, I mean, maybe that's part of what we say is that because I look at the American experience where they're just throwing tons of money. We're not doing that. And maybe that's what we say is that we don't think there's a grand strategy. We want to do something. Well, well I, I, that was my intro to saying this, is that I think there are so many difficult things that need to be discussed and fleshed out. And there are so many uh, interests coming from different value perspectives that the conversation needs to be set up. And that's where I was saying my first point is there needs to be a strategy uh, process put in place that, you know, to the extent that I know a little bit about it is like the national housing strategy. And, not, and that's what I'm saying, and probably better than the way that was done. Um, but what would, what would are, you what would it be, Jeb? It would be what? Well, I, I, I mean, obviously, there's a huge conversation needs to be had is, is are we going to are we still going to continue to be a non value added producing resource economy? Or is there something else we can actually pull off? Because, you know, to to point to a few Canadian tech companies and say we're going to leverage AI and be a center of AI innovation in the world is all lovely Canadian thinking. Like that's that is a Canadian way of being. It's like, oh sure, we can be the best, but there's the reality of geopolitics and the economics of the system means there's probably only a few things we can do from a competitive vantage point of view. We need to have that the analysis brought to the table and understand what the real opportunity is it could be in housing production globally you know because you have a crisis we got some problems to solve so if we focused our resources on thinking of it and in bc there's been a lot of innovation around uh construct in the construction industry well you know i mean we used to we used to export how great our cities are but the mm -hmm. you know we used, to, we used to have the we used to have all of the cities you guys are in they used to be seen as in the top 10 across the country, across the world. Uh, so I guess that's a question, but you know, we also are subsidizing battery plants. We're doing all sorts of interesting things. Anybody else have a thought on this? Oh, Fanny's got her hand up looking at the battery plant. As soon as I mentioned battery plant. I'm like, I help, think... help. Um, <laughs> no, it's all rooted in um, linear economy. It's not right. circular. It's based on ex resource extraction. So I don't see like how we're going to resolve like the tra energy transition with investing in batteries on like wetlands. Yeah, I know. Uh, um, I'm afraid I'm with you on that, but I know that those communities are very, uh, but this is part of what Katz was saying. He was saying all the money that's being thrown into that sector in the U.S. is basically industrialized sprawl. 
And it's not actually creating any jobs for inner cities, for downtowns. Patty, you're in the resource sector. You, you're in the belly of the beast there. What, we certainly what, are. And what I, kind of conversation do you think is possible to have about the relationship between economy and communities? Well, I mean, in the case of the resource sector, uh, and for better or for worse, and this might be the bell, a bellwether or a touchstone, that conversation is happening in Alberta. There are some of the largest um, uh, oil and gas who now call themselves energy companies who are looking at other ways, who are looking at carbon capture. If you want to buy the cleanest oil, you should be buying it from Canada, not Saudi Arabia. Right. Do Canadians know that? Right. Do 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 Canadians know that this conversation is happening in Alberta and, and actually conversations around clean energy are happening with the Energy Futures Lab in Alberta? And, and there are people in the chat throwing in stuff about hydrogen. So there are people that know, but you're Absolutely. quite right. I don't think it's a narrative that's your premier is not telling that story. She's telling a bunch of other stories, but <laughs> which is why we need creatives and citizens and communities on the ground, right? Like to your point, Mary, about the US and throwing money at it. The other thing they have is like when the entire population of Canada could fit into California. No. That we they are not so far apart. There aren't the literally great distances apart. Right. So, you know, in the chat, I said if we think about our cities as those living labs where we can do proof of concept, where in community we know each other because we break bread together, we see each other in, in other settings. You're in the circle together all the time. That's, we work at the speed of trust because of that. We can come up with these small experiments in a way that you're not necessarily gonna do when there are literally thousands of miles between you. Zoom is only gonna do so much to connect us. And getting together once a year courtesy of CUI is only going to get us so far. But I, I, I really, really encourage all of you, if you're not already on it, get on a reconciliation journey. Get to know the original peoples and the first peoples on your land and your territory and learn about how they walk in this world. What could we do? We have to restore trust, Mary. Mm -hmm. And I know in my community, there is very little of that with government. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the communities where there is trust. And that's actually the nonprofit sector and corporation CEOs. So if you know that, yeah. then why wouldn't you use that? That's why you build up your small experiments and you actually formalize the hypothesis because you look at the resources and the assets you have. Who's mm -hmm. most trusted? What are the greatest gifts? What do you know most about? Mm -hmm. um, and, and use those to benefit a conversation that you can then scale up and not rely. I, even if I did have a premier that was telling that story, who's going to believe her anyway? She's an yeah, no, elected. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. So why mm -hmm. waste, waste? Why dedicate energy to that when if you redirected the energy to those who have trust, who people do believe? Um, who can affect a change, even at a small granular level. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you try that? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting sort of, I don't know if you guys do New Year's resolutions, but it's an interesting thing to challenge ourselves to say, what kinds of environments can we put ourselves into next mm -hmm. year that expose us to other other approaches that build a sense of common trust? Donnie, you were in the parks business yeah. for years. Yeah. I was. That's and, part and of what, I, that's part of what that's about, right? Yeah, and and you know, I I hundred percent, and I have to say two things. One to Patty's uh, comments, and and just the whole notion, we as Canadians need to recognize when greenwashing is happening, and be able to you know make our decisions wisely, make sure we're not uh, seeing you know better uh, carbon emissions <laughs> versus no carbon emissions. Like, what's the choice? Um, I also wanted to make a statement that. Unhoused people are not the issue, and we focus on unhoused people as the issue. Housing, lack of housing is the issue, a lack of housing options. And we spend so much time and energy going after and attacking unhoused populations. That's not that we need to turn this around and understand that that's not the way to solve this. And where are we spending our energy? And the last thing I'll say is that um, you asked who is missing from the uh, summit. And I think I would like to, in future summits, hear 
more voices from architects who are relentlessly curious and who are building communities, not just structures, but working to build communities. And those are some of, to Patty's point, the creative minds that are out there. Yeah. Yeah, we did get feedback from the design community. There were some in the audience, but a lot of them are going, and some of them are on the chat. Uh, but I hear you. There's other sectors, and of course, the diversity piece, obviously. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Any last last thoughts about what you think the parties should be? Yes, Mr. Brugman. Well, I, you know, this this all has been lurking maybe behind this conversation, but certainly in my mind as a closer, which is, um, I don't know how much we as a community of broadly defined community practice, and we've got some diversity here and we'll bring in the design professionals and things like that. I think in Canada, there's something, maybe it's everywhere. Without us engaging and building social movements, I don't know how much of this big innovation we're gonna get. And yeah. for instance, if housing is the issue, um, there needs to be a much more concerted cross-national, cross-city social movement around it to get every all of these levels of government that are complacent by nature uh, to, to get on with all the things we know they can do. And I don't know, Patty, whether you would agree with me or, or Donnie totally as well, do. but there's a sense that when it comes to indigenous peoples, I don't know if it's like a cultural shift because it, it wasn't like a, the, a typical social movement broadly societally defined. Obviously uh, um, within the nations, there's a movement, but there there's a shift that's happened there that is more about recognizing and getting on with the work that needs to be done. So we can learn from that as well. Like. I, I don't know if you agree that the shift is happening, but it does seem to me that um, even in our conversation at this summit, that there's a much broader embrace and understanding and wanting to learn from and recognizing. And so there's a lesson there too that we might apply to some of these other issues, but the base isn't putting enough pressure in, in an hey. organized way. Power to the base, Fanny, yeah. last thought. Thank you. Last thought, um, it makes me think about the model of uh, innovation zones in Quebec for economic development that forces um, teaching research institutions, the industry uh, to um, come up with a plan for local uh, yep. economic development and apply that innovation zone model to community development. So right. I will think about that. Thank you. That's a good idea. Donnie and then Patty. I just, I'm, I'm appreciative, Mary, that these conversations are happening. I think if you had just left your elbow hole as a fashion statement, your mom would have been happy. That's all I have to say. Patty? Thank you very much. Um, I uh, come to Calgary. We'd love to show you what's happening here. We work with our friends in economic development and tourism development all the time. And, and we, we create, it's a systems change. And that systems change is about changing a mindset, right? They'll go look up, uh, uh, Peter Singel and 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 we need to work on that mindset change and the way you'll do that is by making people feel something instead of saying we don't have enough of this and we don't have enough of that we need mm -hmm. to feel things for each other mm -hmm. and that you do that at the local level you know I often say that cities are an act of empathy absolutely they have to be and when we're not like we've seen in this last several days that's when we get in trouble and we got to remind ourselves of that. We want to be generous and empathetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everybody enjoy some kind of moment of urban empathy over the next couple of day weeks as you take a bit of a break. We'll be back. Uh, we have a city talk actually a week from today on um, Toronto's challenge around a new economic development strategy that's inclusive and uh, and forward thinking and embracing of diversity and different scales and all that kind of thing. So that's a week from today. For those of you that are interested in that, uh, you'll get a newsletter about it. And in the meantime, we will be posting Hope Springs Eternal, the team that, thank you for all your kudos about November 30th, the team that produced November 30th is here on this. Uh, Wendy, our videographer, and Andrea, our podcaster, and then Sam and Emily and Laura and a whole team of folks that carried the burden of the logistics of that. And they are telling me that all the recordings from the 30th are going to be posted soon. So you'll be able to watch them. You'll be able to watch yourselves. You'll be able to watch others. You'll be able to send it to friends. And the important thing is that none of this is really fast. Like we learn and learn and learn again, and we listen to each other again. And then the third time, maybe we hear it, you know? So I'm so appreciative of Jeb and Fanny and Patty and Donnie coming back on with us, coming to Ottawa, but also helping us just kind of continue in the process of sense-making. So I wish you a, 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 let's hope a, a peaceful, let's hope we have a peaceful holiday season, more peaceful than we've had. And thank you for joining us. And um, uh, we'll see you in 2024.
And I'll see some of you in Toronto next week uh, for the last C talk of the season. Thanks, everybody.